North Korea test fires a Hwasong-18 intercontinental ballistic missile on Monday morning that reportedly holds the potential to reach the U.S. So what is the background behind this latest display of defiance? What is the relevance of the trilateral missile warning system that went into effect on Tuesday? And what are the nuclear contingency strategies to be adopted by Seoul and Washington starting next year? Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Issues and Insiders. I'm Min San Hee. Today we touch upon tensions on the Korean Peninsula amid fresh missile test launches by North Korea and more. For this, I have Jack Barton live on the line. Jack, it's good to have you on. Pleasure to be here. I also have Nicholas Smith with us. Nicola, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Right then, Jack, let's begin with details about Pyongyang's latest provocations and their apparent purpose. Well, the latest is the launch of the missile you just mentioned, the Hwasong-18. It's the fifth uh, intercontinental ballistic missile test this year, uh, but this seems to be by far their most advanced ICBM so far. Uh, we've heard from Japanese officials doing some of the maths, saying it flew at a lofted trajectory, about uh, 6,500 kilometers, a little bit more um, in altitude, uh, a distance of about 1,000 kilometers before it dropped down. And, and then when they did the maths, they said, well, if it were flying at a more horizontal uh, sort of angle, then it could probably go about 15,000 kilometers. And that means it could actually hit anywhere on the mainland United States. So this is indeed a very powerful weapon. Uh, Pyongyang, uh, the state media there, we see a, a statement from Kim Jong-un saying this is, of course, all in response to recent actions by the United States and uh, South Korea blaming what he describes as their hysteria, uh, a, a reference there to the recent meeting between South Korea and the United States uh, to rediscuss uh, nuclear policy and a decision at those meetings to uh, begin to reevaluate. Uh, nuclear policy strata or the strategy to how a uh, uh, both would deal with a nuclear strike by the DPRK and to keep updating those policies, um, but also to the new real-time information sharing agreement between the United States, Japan and South Korea. But if we look back, we see that the DPRK announced last year when it enshrined its nuclear policy, it was going to be carrying out lots of tests. Uh, we're expecting many more tests to come. It's just they seem to be timing them whenever there's an event and then blaming it on whatever that event is and saying, see, this is all your fault. Right, indeed. Nicola, as Jack mentioned, Pyongyang claims that the latest missile test launches come in response to plans by Seoul and Washington to enhance their nuclear contingency strategies. Could you tell us a bit more about these plans? Yes, well, Jack mentioned a meeting uh, between senior US and South Korean officials, and that happened on December 16th over the weekend. It was the second meeting of the Nuclear Consultative Group, which is a group that emerged out of the state visit by President Yoon to Washington earlier this year, and that it aims to shore up the extended nuclear deterrence commitments that the US has already made to South Korea, and also to integrate South Korea more into US planning for contingencies on the peninsula that might involve nuclear use. And this, this meeting made a very strong statement. Uh, they said that any, any nuclear attack by North Korea against the US or its allies is unacceptable and would result in the end of the Kim regime. They also said that any nuclear act uh, by attack by North Korea on South Korea uh, would be met with swift, overwhelming and a decisive response. And uh, the, the group has already, the two countries have already been deepening cooperation on things like information sharing protocols, uh, nuclear consultation processes in crises and nuclear strategic planning. But during this meeting, they also agreed to update the, the nuclear deterrence and contingency strategies and incorporate nuclear operations scenarios in combined military exercises. And, and this is what has um, alarmed North Korea and what it's been uh, it, it's been responding to. Uh, so there haven't been many details about what this actually means, but uh, South Korea's national deputy national security advisor who was at that meeting said that they, they, they had agreed to complete guidelines 
um, for the planning and operation of a nuclear strategy by the middle of next year. And all of this has, has really been um, designed to ease South Korea's worries about North Korea's uh, provocations, which have been increasing uh, over the past couple of years, while also keeping Seoul from pursuing its own nuclear weapons program. But North Korea, um, as Jack said, sees this as a major threat and has said that any attempt to use military force against it will be met with deadly counteraction. Right. And, and Jack, you mentioned the missile warning system. This particular system shared by Seoul Turk in Washington, it went into effect as of Tuesday. What would you say is the relevance of this trilateral collaboration? Well, this is very important. In the past, Japan uh, shared information with the United States in real time and South Korea shared information with the US in real time, but Japan and South Korea didn't share the information, uh, at least in real time. They could apply for the information and then get it later. Uh, but these two are really an asset to each other because you could say that Japan uh, has very good reach into the East Sea. And so if there are missiles or there are activities in the East Sea, uh, Japan is very good at sweeping up that information. Whereas South Korea, uh, because of its proximity, obviously, to North Korea, is very good at uh, detecting launches, uh, seeing launches before they happen, and getting a lot of real-time information on what's happening on the peninsula. So in terms of Japan's defense, it's definitely improved by knowing what's happening in real time in North Korea, uh, which it couldn't previously. And for South Korea also, Japan, of course, is much better at monitoring submarine activity. And this is the big danger because we keep looking at the big, uh, like the long range missiles and uh, even the medium range missiles, they're quite easy to shoot down. But a short range nuclear tipped missile from a submarine is very difficult to intercept unless you get to it very quickly. And that's the kind of information that Japan can now give to South Korea in real time. So that's a big boost to the security uh, of both countries. Now, having said that, of course, at the same time, North Korea is upgrading its uh, capabilities. We've seen the recent spy satellite launch. Now it seems like they're trying to build an AWAC plane, uh, which is a type of plane most people have seen. It's uh, got like a UFO disc on the top and that's very good at tracking submarines and uh, also detecting launches. So overall, there is a race for real-time security. But this agreement between uh, Japan, South Korea and the United States, uh, I think it, in a way it's a game changer in terms of early warning systems for Japan and South Korea. Right, and speaking about early warning systems, uh, Nicola, like Jack was saying, North Korea is believed to be building an early warning radar plane, I hear. What are the implications of this particular initiative? Yes, well, what we know so far is that satellite imagery is suggesting that North Korea may be building an airborne early warning and control aircraft. And this satellite imagery has come from Planet Labs and has been analysed by the James Martin Centre for Non-Proliferation Studies in the United States. And so if confirmed, uh, this would offer Pyongyang advance warning of aircraft or missile strikes from the south. Uh, it, it's also quite surprising if uh, the North has been able to add this to its Air Force fleet. As we know, um, it's, this is mainly made up of uh, aging Soviet era uh, aircraft. And so it could also suggest that Russia is helping with technology. We have no confirmation of that. But looking at its abilities, then it would certainly um, be offer considerable advantages to Pyongyang uh, if it would extend the airborne radio, uh, radar coverage um, and provide prior warning of a potential attack from South Korea incoming aircraft and missiles during the opening moments of a conflict. And it could also enhance its own surface to air missile uh, equipment. And it would also provide a new tool for um, for uh, its own surveillance of the border for monitoring South Korea's airspace and activities. It would provide a look down uh, capability that it currently doesn't have, that, which would help it um, to combat the problem of, of high terrain. Right, and against that backdrop, Jack, here in South Korea, the Defence Ministry has spoken of boosting related spending over the next five years. What more can you share with us? 
You know, they're talking about spending uh, 87, well, the equivalent of 87 billion US dollars over the next five years. It's a big jump from what has been spent. And already we saw big jumps because it's not just the Yoon administration, but uh, even though the Moon administration negotiated hard with uh, North Korea, it also oversaw a big boost in defense uh, spending and uh, a rearrangement of the armed forces. What we're going to see is uh, this money, if it can be gathered, it'll go into the big three main areas of defense. So the kill chain, uh, which is the missile systems that in theory would take out North Korean uh, weapons before they could leave the ground. So when they're about to be fired and then there's the um, air missile defense uh, capability, which is to take out missiles while they're in the air. And finally, we have the Korea Massive Punishment and Retaliation Program. And uh, there they're talking about uh, more troop carrying planes, building up special forces, specialized forces that could operate inside North Korea. And of course, amongst all of this, also building up anti-drone capabilities. Because the big takeout from the war in Ukraine that everybody is learning right now is uh, in modern warfare, sometimes uh, airplanes and uh, even armor tanks are quite useless. And it's really coming down to troops, artillery and drones. So a big focus again on drones. But it, you know, even with all of that in place, it's still the worrying factor who will be in the administration in the US next election. This is always a concern for South Korea because that really defends uh, it's on that that the strength of the nuclear defense from the United States uh, really hinges. And of course, someone like Joe Biden compared to someone like Donald Trump uh, gives a very different sort of commitment level to South Korea. So this spending will make a lot of difference, but it's not going to bridge that ultimate gap. The fact that North Korea has nuclear weapons, South Korea doesn't, and it depends on the U.S. Right, indeed. Nicholas, staying in South Korea, but moving beyond cross-border tensions, let's uh, now talk about uh, domestic headlines. Uh, first up, on the economic front, the IMF claims that the Korean economy has been rather resilient in the face of uh, challenges, both at home and abroad. Speaking within your capacity as an Asia correspondent, Nicola, covering various events, of course, what do you believe has kept the South Korean economy afloat this particular year? Well, the IMF managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, said on Friday the South Korean economy remains resilient amidst, amid signs of global recovery um, and that inflation is forecast to, to moderate. She, she did talk quite extensively about the domestic reasons for this uh, while putting it in a, in a wider context. And, and to just look firstly at, at the domestic reasons. Uh, she said that it was resilient because of um, she credited an effective policy response within South Korea. She said that the Bank of Korea has taken decisive action uh, since last year and that financial authorities are pursuing fiscal normalization uh, and that the IMF supports uh, the policy direction of South Korea. And she also said that the government has been acting responsibly to normalize its fiscal stance. Uh, and in this context, uh, the IMF has projected growth in Korea to strengthen from 1.4 percent to 2.2 percent in 2024. There are also external factors, uh, outside factors. Are, of course, the, the, the Chinese economy is performing better than expected, according to the IMF. And so this is beneficial for export orientated economies like South Korea. And um, China is obviously the biggest the biggest trading partner. So economic growth has held steady on the back of recovering exports and uh, looking specifically at uh, semiconductors uh, and machineries and equipment. And um, more generally, there have been recent hopes that uh, of a resurgent global technology demand that will continue to drive Korean exports. Right, hopefully. Jack, beyond the economy, the Yoon administration has also sought to address a host of issues within its academic arena. Which related initiative, Jack, do you care to shed light on as we, end, as we look to end this year? Well, a couple of my friends are Korean teachers, so the one I hear a lot is about the, uh, the state in the schools at the moment or the, the concerns that revolve around the Child Wel Welfare Act, which of course was brought in to protect 
students, uh, to stop them from physical, sexual or emotional abuse, and that's a good thing. Uh, unfortunately, because it's a little bit vague, we've seen teachers now come under so much pressure that we've even seen a spate of recent suicides by teachers uh, who are coming under a lot of parental pressure. Uh, under this act, pretty much anyone can be accused of abuse, even if it's a lack of smiling at a child or not helping a child access the phone. Or my friend was telling me one story about how a teacher at their school uh, they'd be rung by the parents to say, you have to wake my child up every morning. You have to ring them and wake them up and tell them it's ready for school. And they said, look, I can't do that. And the teacher said, well, we're going to file against you for abuse. And uh, when you get a charge of abuse, you are suspended. It's not like a process where you have to wait. So it's like nine out of 10 teachers saying they fear abuse, a quarter of teachers getting psychiatric care. And now the UN government saying, you know, we want these protective measures in place, but we need to define uh, what abuse is. So, you know, we really know if this is a case of abuse or not. And parents who wrongly accuse abuse and knowingly do so, they can get punished in turn. And uh, a whole lot of reforms there just to ensure that teachers and students are both looked after. And the good news is, in this move, it's the, probably the only bit of legislation where the Democrat Party, the o opposition party, uh, seems to be on board so both parties you know trying to move forward with this legislation that's going to bring a little bit of calm back into the classroom right indeed it's getting a bit of support from across the aisle so nicola also on the social front findings shared this past monday by statistics korea i believe show close to three out of ten newlywed couples uh, seek to pursue a double income no kids lifestyle now these findings have raised fresh alarm that is of a curious population prospects do you believe this alarm nicola is well founded yes absolutely the alarm bells have been ringing very loudly for years and it's not that uh, successive governments are not listening or th they haven't heard these alarms but they, so far they haven't been able to find the right solutions to to resolve the underlying reasons for this demographic crisis and, and for young people deciding that, that they don't want to or they can't have children. Um, and this year we saw the fertility rate hit 0 0.7 children per woman uh, in the second quarter of this year. And that was another record low for South Korea, which already has the world's lowest birth rate. So there, there clearly is an issue to be resolved here uh, because the replacement level of um, 2.1 children that would keep the population steady at, at about 51 million is just not being met. And it's going to be very difficult to reverse that trend. Um, we're looking at a super aging society by 2025 um, and and we're also on um, on the current trajectory. Uh, two out of five people will be aged 65 or above by 2050, and that obviously has huge economic ramifications. It has implications for the workforce, um, uh, for the military, um, socially, and so this is something that, that every government has been trying to resolve and and to look at. And uh, recently, uh, Han Dong Hoon, the the uh, Justice Minister put it in the starkest of terms that South Korea is facing extinction, extinction if it doesn't embrace immigration, which has been seen as one potential uh, uh, solution to to trying to at least ease the crisis. Uh, he said that you know he was he was simply talking about uh, a body that would oversee immigration, but it's a politically very contentious issue and, and one that, that governments are struggling to, to push through. And uh, many other, there are many other solutions that could be applied to this issue. All of them are quite difficult, again, politically, um, but we're looking at things like better childcare, more affordable housing, and better, even a better workplace culture, especially for young women who have invested so much in their education, uh, their university, they've strived to, to get the job that, that they wanted to um, and find in the workplace that it's not always possible or easy to have a child and keep that job. Right, indeed. And staying with such potential solutions, Jack, I understand you're no expert on the matter, but what would you uh, suggest or propose as potential measures to better address this uh, very dismal-looking uh, reality for South Korea? 
I recently made a documentary on the topic, and you know, I think Nicola covered a lot of the uh, the sort of issues there. Um, you know, we've got the high housing costs. Uh, you know, the, the 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 education pressures here are astronomical. Uh, per capita, it's the most expensive place in the world to raise a child. But interestingly, when I I talk to a lot of people and a lot of you know professors and e economists, and at the end of it, it came down to one of the big factors here as well is the Confucian background. So the fact that women still go out and work and they work long, tough hours, and then they come home and they have to do all the cooking and they have to do everything for the child as well. There's still an expectation in many households that the man just has to go to the office and then come home and the woman has to go to the office and then come home and have her second job, which is to raise the child. And this is something uh, that everybody at the end said needs to change, you know, um, because if we look at the polls, far more men than women want to have babies. And in that light, it's understandable why. Um, having said that, if we look around the world, this is a global issue. The only reason it is so pressing in East Asia, again, as Nicola mentioned, is the lack of immigration. So in Australia, we have the same problem, but we make up for it with mass immigration. Now, the government is changing some of the policies, but it's looking more at extending working visas. So bringing more people into work, but that doesn't mean they have the right to stay on after um, you know, they finish the job. So it is, it's a really tough issue going forward because robots aren't going to do it. They don't pay income tax. So they're not going to pay people's pensions in the future. There has to be some viable uh, form of bringing new people into the workforce so they can contribute taxes and they can pay for that rapidly aging population. And right there, there are far more questions than answers, unfortunately. Right, which is why governments across the world are seeking to better address this issue. All right, Jack, as always, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. And Nicola, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right, well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching and be sure to join us same time tomorrow.